Good morning, welcome to Cusco. My name is Clint Fandrick. I am the general manager of Mundo Sostenible's project implementation team here in Peru. Uh, I live in Arequipa. Hi, my name is Matthew Preciolandis. I am the vice president of Mundo Sostenible. I do the outreach and development, and I live in Madison, Wisconsin. Hello, my name is Emily Breeden. Uh, I am currently the president of Mundo Sostenible, and I live in Cocoa Beach, Florida, but I have a long history in Peru. Can you share what is Nuestra Energia? Yeah, so Nuestra Energia is our first kind of real flagship program for MSC. What it is, is a program where our organization will pay 50% of the costs of implementing a solar energy project. There's several requirements of facilities here in Peru, um, but just a few of them are um, servicing at least 15 people in a community, um, having 250 soles minimum of electricity consumption, and also having space uh, on a roof or on the grounds near the facility that's accessible to um, connecting the infrastructure in. So Clint, tell us a little bit more about who is, who is benefiting from this. I mean, yeah. Who are those, I mean, who are the partners and, and what it, who, tell us about that. Yeah, so the, the people who we're really targeting are um, primarily kids, children in, the, in, in, in vulnerable communities. So orphanages, um, schools, shelters, even clinics and hospitals, okay. uh, and, and community centers. Great. Okay, so we are in Cusco because last October, September 2021, we came to Cusco to do some evaluations for a couple projects here in town. Uh, several orphanages, schools, shelters, and through the process of the last few months, we uh, secured contracts and got equipment for two projects in particular. So what we're doing in Cusco right now is uh, wrapping up some of our project development. Uh, this is implementing uh, the system, putting in solar panels, installing uh, inverters, configuring the systems, getting everything ready to go so that, uh, so that when we leave town, it works properly. So Emily, would you like to talk a little bit about some of the projects we're doing here? Sure, and something I wanted to add too is that we are also helping educate and that's that kind of leads into the projects that we're working on. Um, so one of the projects is La Eco Escuela Simatauca, which means the eco school um, and it's the town of Simatauca. And Simatauca is very, it's about 30, 40 minutes from Cusco up in, in the Andes Mountains, the most beautiful place you can imagine. And this is a school that really focuses on teaching kids how to reduce, reuse, recycle, how to grow their own um, plants, their own foods, how to help the whole community. And it really focuses on giving back to, and making the world a better place. And so this is a very special school that um, is run by a woman named Patricia. And the kids are between ages four and 12. And so part of us doing this project is also helping educate and share this technology with the kids and this community. Um, and then the second project is um, Madre Teresa de Calcutta, which is a facility for people with special needs in the community that do not have any family to take care of them. And so it's almost like an orphanage, but for kids. And also there are adults there too. And um, it's a very special place run by a few sisters. Um, Karen is a volunteer that we've gotten really close with to help with this project. And Clint, do you want to talk about more about the project? Yeah, sure. So the project of Simatauka is really exciting for a variety of reasons. Number one, it's the biggest project we've done to date, by far. It's really, really exciting. Um, the aspects of this project were a big challenge for us, but it was a awesome learning experience. So the system is a 5.3 kilowatt system, uh, DC, and we have a 10 kilowatt inverter there. The, the system is arranged in two arrays that are more or less independent, but are obviously uh, wired into the same inverter. Uh, the system at Madre Teresa is about half that size. It's about uh, 2.3 kilowatts. And that system also uses a 10 kilowatt inverter. Both systems are what we call grid-tied, which means that there's no batteries involved. 
the system is tied directly into the grid. So there's a balancing act between consumption from the facility and what it needs from the solar when the solar is available. And then when the solar is not available, pulling from the grid. So the, the both facilities energy needs are always met either from solar or the grid. The, the benefit of having a system at a school is obviously most of the activities are done during the day. And so we think we can take a large chunk out of the consumption profile at Simatauka especially because most of their activity is during the day. With Mother Teresa, it's still the case that a lot of their activity is during the day, but they still have you know meals at night and some activities and the lights are on in the facility. And so it'll be very interesting to compare and contrast the savings that we see from each of these two facilities. So Matt, tell us a little bit about your experience on the sites. Uh, is there particular people that stood out to you? Was there some experience that you thought was memorable? Yeah, there definitely was. I have to say, um, especially at Mother Teresa, really it was kind of interesting and kind of I almost felt at home um, because really there was this gentleman by the name of, of Jose and Jose would kind of follow us around. He was really intrigued. Very yeah, he curious. reminded me a lot of my special needs daughter and um, was not verbal to an extent. Um, but there was this cognitive ability that he just, you just feel as there's this love. That he just wanted to, what were we up to? You know, what were we doing? Um, and he just wanted to know what, why we were there because we were kind of strangers in, in his eyes. Um, and from that, really, you could just see like, but by the time we left, we weren't strangers anymore. But we were his family. It was almost like we were a part of his life in a way that he, like every time we came in, he was like, you know, he would fist bump us and he would yeah. always want us, you know, follow us around and, and take cardboard and put it down for us to make sure that things were staying stable. And it was really, really just, I don't know, it was kind of choked me up a little bit because I literally was reminded of my special needs daughter, Mamna, back home. And I was just like, I, I know what that's like. And I can, I can imagine what these sisters deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and to help them out was just amazing. It really was. Awesome. Yeah, and a way that Mundo Sostenible is able to help them is by installing solar energy. Now, instead of giving all their money and resources to the energy company, they can actually redirect those resources to the things they need. And that the, you know, nutrition, education, supplies, um, supplies that'll help keep the kids safe, the, the workers, the volunteers safe. There's a lot of resources that these facilities need and that they will be able to afford if they're not giving all their money to the energy company. And that's why Mundo Sostenible is so passionate about helping um, get solar projects implemented into these facilities. And to give you an idea of the scale of those savings, uh, at Simatauka particularly, we've, we've kind of done a little bit of prognosticating, a little bit yeah. of estimation of what the energy savings is going to be. This system could save them as much as $1,600 a year. Now that might sound like not that much to in our U.S. context, but here in Peru, that is enormous. That's books, that's computers, that's uh, food, other resources, just as Emily said, uh, at the facility. So it's a, it's a huge savings. And what percentage do you think that is? Uh, right now we're looking at between maybe 45 and 50 percent at Simatauka. With Madre Teresa, it's a little bit more difficult. We've had to be a little bit more conservative. We're saying between maybe 35 and 40 percent. Um, but we're happy to say that with the projects that we've already done in the past, our estimates have been low. And so we're really happy to say that the yeah. systems have actually outperformed our estimates. And what kind of percentages have you seen on the projects we've already done? It's a good question. This is something I'm really proud of. So um, a system that we installed last November, we it was a battery system. So obviously there's a little bit more savings involved there. We were estimating somewhere between um, 50 and 57%. Last month when we were there, we saw their electricity bills, they're saving 70%, 70%. It's a huge savings for them. Wow, that is incredible. All right, so Clint, those percentages are really, really high, especially if you look at the, what you see in the US at, for paybacks for solar projects. Yeah. Why is it so high? Why is the payback so good here? Paybacks are great for a variety of reasons. Excellent question. Number one, we're in one of the best places on planet Earth to do solar. There's a couple reasons for that. Number one, we're in the southern part of Peru, you've got a lot of uh, arid landscapes where there's not a lot of cloud cover. Number two, the, the altitude is pretty extreme here, so we have a very stable atmosphere above us. Number three is that we're in uh, the tropics, and so the kind of the profile of where the sun is in the sky is pretty regular year-round. 
furthermore, the, the, the actual project implementation costs are lower here. So you've got lower labor costs, uh, often lower materials costs. And that translates into um, less kind of upfront cost on, on these investments. And so the power that we're generating, which again is a little bit more. So for example, Matt, you, you saw when we, when we first plugged in the array at Simatauka, we plugged in a meter to see what the voltage was. And what did we see? Just it was just skyrocketing because it was so the panels that are already were working. I mean, it was, it was kind of really cool. So what we see is the 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 plaque on the back of the of the solar panel says that it's going to put out X amount. But what we see here in Peru, because of the conditions in the atmosphere and because of our position in the world, solar panels actually outperform the lab by quite a bit. And so all of that kind of translates into a much faster return on investment. There's more production and there's less upfront cost. And so that just adds up to a, a much faster return on investment. Wow, fantastic. So with, with doing these projects, what are some of the challenges that you've seen and that we're running into? <laughs> funny, funny, funny you ask that. Because uh, Clint and I know have talked about this several times and I now got a firsthand experience as to what it is to have you know, to experience this on the ground, because in the United States, you know, I do construction stuff like that, but that's not saying a whole lot, to be honest. Um, that doesn't paint the whole picture, because number one, the biggest, the first one was the altitude shift, going from in Madison, Wisconsin, which is roughly about a thousand feet, to times twelve to about twelve thousand feet overnight. Um, and when I got here, the first thing it was like, ooh, boy, I'm not just feeling so hot. This and just that kind of. It just kind of plays with you for a little bit. So I give props to these guys for really, you know, tackling that. The second part was was the shift in just the exposure to the sun. I mean, again, you're up so high, so you don't think about it, even though you may see the weather say 70 degrees. No, no, no. It's, it feels a, hot, a lot hotter than that. So imagine, you're not, you know, you're putting these panels up, like our guy Rafa, our head engineer, when he's up there, I'm just like, every time I put a panel up to him, I was just like relieved. But then I remembered my, you know, and thought to myself, wow, he's got like another 40 minutes to go until this thing's locked in until the next panel goes up, which means over time, he's up on this, up on the roof for four hours throughout the day. So translate that throughout the whole day. So when we come and say that the project will take this many days, it's really important to factor in like, wow, like, yes, it's hard work, but in this days, I'm sorry, guys, <laughs> there's nobody that compares to this kind of line of work. And so that's why coming to, you know, planning and paying fair wages to these people is really, really super important. And I, I like to really commend Clint for his work and how, his planning skills and really following through and, and paying these guys the fair amount that they, they deserve. Another thing I just want to mention is the challenges that we've experienced as an organization, um, given the kind of change in the the way that global supply chains work for pretty much everything from computers to cars to food as well. The pandemic has really taken a toll on global supply chains. As it turns out, Peru isn't really a uh, high priority on the global supply chain. So when we're in the States, there's so many things at our fingertips and it's really hard to fully grasp the amount of just the availability of stuff things um, for us in the United States. You know, you can order things on Amazon. It's there in a couple days at, at, at most. So, same day. Yeah, same day as well. Yeah. So here in Peru, we really have to be agile and, and smart about how we plan projects in the future, sometimes without even knowing what, what projects are coming down the line. So that requires us um, to maintain an inventory. And that requires us to expend more resources. And so it's really important for us to to, to be very knowledgeable about what's going on with supply chains in the country, to be talking to our vendors and our providers, um, you know, to be in constant communication with them. This, this thing is not gonna be available. We need, we need time to get this. It's really important for us, especially when we're planning uh, things like in Cusco here, because we're not in Cusco. Our, our organization is based in Arequipa. And so when we're talking about taking equipment from our Arequipa to Cusco, we gotta be really, really smart and plan far ahead, get contracts signed early, get payments made early, all those kinds of things so that we can make sure that we have the equipment we need in order for the project to be done successfully. Yeah, on that note, actually, I mean, it's we're kind of unorthodox in that way, right? Because like, we're like, it's like, you have, we have this like, we maybe call it like United States mentality where this organization is kind of foreign, I guess, in a way. Like, it's not like the norm. And I think, but what that norm I think is brought is a lot of security to a lot of, a lot of these places. And so that's why, I actually, again, going to your organization skills, Huge props to the fact that when 
you're traveling from Arequipa, which is roughly what eight and a half hours away or something like that. Yeah. So about, about so about you know, but that distance, I mean, is not. You can just go home and go get it. Right. You know, it's not. We have a. You can just go back to the shop and get it. Um. So yeah. And well, another, another thing along those lines that we found is that, you know, not all of these these pieces of equipment are available in all of these cities. Um. Right. You know, Cusco is known as a tourist town for obvious reasons. It's a beautiful place. There's some amazing things to see, but. It's not exactly your industrial hub in Peru, and so um, you know we have to ship these things in from Lima. I have to ship them in from from Arequipa. Sometimes, such as the equipment we use for these two projects, we had to order them directly from the factory in China, and so it's just amazing to have to. You know, we're digging into a global supply chain. That's exactly what it is. So Clint, so if I'm one, someone watching this, like, what am I? What's my takeaway? What am I? You know, really getting from this? Yeah. So there is so much opportunity here. We've, every, every project we've done has kind of spawned two or three others. And so just in Cusco, we've talked to some other folks who want projects as well. And, you know, we've, we've got an enormous amount of demand and we're able to meet it as an organization, but what we really need is, is resources and, and, and outside help. Right, I mean, the infrastructure is in place, but what we really need are partners, sponsors, funding, and donors and just more resources so we can actually make these projects happen for all of these facilities that are in need. And again, you know, projects similar to these in the United States, um, you know, they're great and they should be happening. But here in the in the developing places in the world, there's there's not a lot of, of, of expertise. You know, we have two engineers on our team that are just absolutely wonderful. They're a really rare find. But also fundamentally, just to go back to a previous point, developing these projects here in Peru is so much cheaper. Like the, the amount of, of savings that we get, the amount of economic output, the amount of, of, of CO2 emission savings is per dollar spent is so much larger than a place like the United States and Europe. So if you're looking for where should we be putting our money in the fight against climate change or where should we be putting our money in the fight against poverty, these are the places we should be putting those, those dollars. Thank you. So thank you all for, for watching. Thank you all for, for tuning in. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Hey! And check out our website. Um, it's, you know, where you just got the kicking. And if you have any questions, even if it's technical questions, that's fine. Hit us up. You know, uh, we, we'd be glad to answer those. So uh, click on the link. Absolutely. And join us for all the virtual events. We're doing one a month, and we'd love to see you there. We're also doing some in-person fundraising events in New York and DC this June, so just yeah. a couple months from now. Yeah. Stay tuned to our events page, we'll have all the information there. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.